Hey y'all, welcome back to the Hack Shack. Today we've got another box from the folks at Hacker Boxes. This is Hacker Box 102, and the name is Flea Scope. Let's get this on the bench and see what we have inside here. Here we have some preformed breadboard jumper wires. This is a one meter micro USB cable. These are some male female DuPont jumper wires. And this is the star of the show here, the Flea Scope USB oscilloscope. Check it out. Pretty darn neat. This is the brainchild of Rich Testardi. I hope I got that name right. Sorry if I didn't, but check it out. It is really neat. Whether you're a seasoned oscilloscope vet and you see the value in this small affordable device that you can just kind of throw in a go bag, or if you're a newbie who's intimidated by oscilloscopes, you'll be on your way to understanding the basics of oscilloscope operation with this neat little device. Here we have a 10K potentiometer. This is a 100 millihenry coil inductor. This is a piezo buzzer. We also have five green five millimeter LEDs, five blue five millimeter LEDs, some 1K resistors, some tactile momentary switches, some header pins, and some ceramic capacitors. This is our 400 point solderless breadboard. This is our P6100 1X 10X oscilloscope probe. This switch right here I'm pointing to, that's where you switch it between 1X and 10X. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And that's a little hook you can use to grab on the stuff when you're probing. Here we've got our three exclusive HackerBox and FleeScope stickers. And last but not least, we've got our HackerBox 102 collectible reference card with our low pass and high pass filter drawings on this side and a cool picture of the FleeScope with the pinouts on the back. Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, PCBWay. Discover the power of seamless PCB prototyping with PCBWay. Fast, reliable, and affordable PCB manufacturing services at your fingertips. Stay tuned for my upcoming video where I share how easy it was to create my first PCBs with PCBWay. Just like they always do, the folks from Hacker Boxes have included a great set of instructions here available on Instructables. I have a link to that in the description. Even if you don't have the Hacker Box, you might find it pretty handy. So following along with the instructable, the first thing we do is plug the flea scope into our computer using the supplied micro USB cable. And we should see the red, green, and blue LEDs illuminate. And it looks like we're seeing that as expected here. Next, we go to the flea scope GUI by hitting that link in the instructable and click start connect on the GUI. In the pop-up window, we'll select the port associated that says flea scope and hit connect. Then we connect up the 10X probe to the BNC coax connector of the flea scope. Then we switch from 10X mode to 1X mode with a little slide switch. Then we're gonna clip the probe onto the outermost pinhole of the three pin wave header. This connects the output of the waveform generator to the scope input. Then we switch back over to the GUI, we should see a sine wave on the oscilloscope display. Next, we are instructed to play around a bit with the waveform generator, change the shape from sine wave to square and triangle, see what that looks like, and also play around with the hertz output, going from one kilohertz default to three kilohertz and seeing how that looks different. Next, the instructable advises us to use our supplied header pins and break them into two sets of 12 and two sets of three. And basically we're gonna put them in as you see them in this illustration here. And it says optionally you can solder the headers in. So I went ahead and did that as well. Next, the instructable has this illustration to show us how to connect our flea scope to a breadboard. And real quick, if this is the first time you've messed with a breadboard, I want you to take a look and see how these purple things are outlined there on the breadboard. The uh, power rails on the outside edges of the board, those you know are one big long strip, so typically used for your positive and negative power. The numbered rows in the middle, like the A, B, C, D, E, and F, G, H, I, J, each one of those groups of five are connected, but they're not connected between the numbered rows. So it's just like separate little five connections per side, per row. Nothing jumps across that middle part. That's a break right there, that groove. So if we connect things up like in the picture here, it should be just like when we were using the probe earlier, but connecting it up in kind of a different way. So you'll see here, I pull off two jumpers out of the bundle that came with the hacker box. 
and I plug in to the breadboard in such a way that the wave out is basically bridged over to the scope in. And then I'm going to switch over here to the application and you can see that I'm seeing it just like I did when I was doing the same thing with the probe. The next thing our instructor wants us to try is to make a voltage divider and we're going to use that with some jumpers, two of our 1k resistors, and uh, just like the little piece of schematic here shows, wave out's going to be on one end of the thing, ground's going to be on the other, and where the two resistors connect in series, that's where we're going to connect our scope in line so we can measure right there where those two resistors meet. And we can see here when we flip over to the actual application that the voltage is just about half of what it was. It's not going the full 3.3 scale. It's about 1.6, give or take. So the voltage divider is working properly. So that's pretty cool. You can also experiment with the frequency, but that should not affect the voltage divider. Next, the instructor wants us to put a potentiometer in place, kind of similarly connected up as we had the voltage divider. And we're going to do that, and it says we should be able to look at the scope, and as we turn the potentiometer back and forth, we ought to see it go from zero all the way to 3.3 volts. And as you can see here, as I'm turning the knob, it does indeed appear to be having that kind of effect on it. All right, so in the next section of the Instructable, it has us go through and we're gonna build a bunch of filters. We're gonna build a high pass and a low pass filter with a resistor and capacitor. And then we're gonna build a high pass and low pass filter that uses a coil and a resistor. So basically you can see if you look at them, uh, the high pass is one way and essentially just flip it to do low pass with both of the type designs there. There's a bunch of theory behind this and how it works. I'll invite you to, you know, hit Google up or look at the Instructable. It's great. It's got some extra detail, but I'm just not going to go into that here. I'm going to rattle through these. You have to take my word for it when I pop them on the breadboard and then we'll see if they work as expected. All right. So the first filter we're going to be doing is this capacitive high pass filter. So I'm grabbing one of those ceramic capacitors from the kit and I'm going to put it with a resistor and on the breadboard I'm going to basically do what you're seeing there in the schematic. And then we're going to go over into the software, switch it to AC mode, and then what we're going to do is look at how it acts based on the input frequency of the circuit. And if you look, this is a high pass, so I just lowered that frequency to 500. So that should not let as much pass. Uh, look at, watch the RMS voltage down there in the bottom right. I see we went back up because the frequency went up. And when it was down, the RMS went down. So that seems to be working as expected. Feel free to rewind to see that. Okay, now I'm going to flip things around here. And you'll see this is where we're doing a capacitive low pass filter. So when we're done with this one, we'll go back into the software. We should see higher RMS when the frequency is lower. And when we go high, it should drop. I'd love to show it to you, but evidently I did not capture when I was actually doing that. Sorry about that. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, for this one, we're going back and building another high pass filter. But this time, instead of a capacitor, we're going to use a coil. So that's going to be an inductive high pass. So if the frequency is over a certain threshold, we should see more voltage in the signal. And if we're below that threshold, it should have more of a cutoff. So let's see if that's what it did. All right, you can see how things look. I'm about to change it from 500 to 5K. Look at the RMS, it's 11.11. .11. Now it's up to 0.56. So definitely letting more through when the frequency is higher. And I'm gonna put it back to 1K. And that's still kind of up there. Now, uh, actually it's down a good bit. 1K drops it to 0.16 again. So definitely more was going through at 5K than 1K with this particular filter. Now let's see, back up to 6K. Now look, we're back up to 0.6 again on the RMS. So that's a high pass inductive filter. Okay, now I'm gonna flip these components around to make an inductive low pass filter. And now we'll see if we get higher voltage at the lower frequencies and if we see it drop when we switch to a higher frequency. All right, so you can see we're at 0.19 at 5K 
and we're going to change that to something lower let's see let's go down to 500 and let's see okay the rms didn't jump much but it is higher at 0.22 and let's see if we go back higher again here in a moment if it goes lower and let's change that to 1k again and let's see if that rms drops it did not let's go to 6k and now we're back down to 0.18 again so not a much of a difference in swing there but it did go down when the frequency went up so meaning more went through when it was lower so to me that counts as a low pass let's see here yep we're back up to 22 when we're at 500 hertz now if you're wondering about real world applications of filters and stuff like that this is one of my favorites because i love music i love speaker design and speaker building and arrangement of filters made to be used with a loudspeaker is called a crossover that in this case like as a two-way speaker is kind of a combination of a high pass and a low pass to separate your high frequency so only those go to your tweeter and your low frequency those go to your woofer in more complex designs such as three-way or greater you'll find that you'll have like a high pass a low pass and potentially multiple band pass ones to cover frequencies that you want to have the top and the bottom shaved off to kind of really focus on particular drivers like a mid-range for example if crossover design or speaker building is something you think you might be into check out these tech talk forums from parts express i've always liked digging in those from time to time to see what folks are building they've got some pretty smart folks in there i'll put a link in the description another real world example where filters are used a great deal besides audio frequency is in the radio frequency realm and in my example that i know of personally or playing around with an sdr i was getting a lot of splash over from my local fm transmitters that were super loud like commercial broadcasters so i had to get a notch filter which is you know a combination of filters that gives you a real specific targeted dip where you bring that way down so there are, are kits or plans you can make your own or you can buy pre-made ones and that helped me get some of that out of there so i could focus on some of the frequencies i wanted to listen to there are tons of filter related topics when it comes to radio okay so the next thing the instructable tells us to check out is the actual stick os basic that's part of the flea scope and there's a different little url you hit and that will actually bring up a basic console on the thing you can do all kinds of debugging run programs from there it's pretty darn cool like check this out all right so the last activity the instructable is going to have us do here is to create a simple simon game that runs in basic and we're going to use some of these other components for buttons and a speaker that kind of thing now when i constructed mine i used two breadboards i didn't use all the wires like in that example but the instructions are there you can follow and do it exactly like that i essentially followed the schematic and ended up with the same end result basically there's a url to some code we take and copy that and paste it into the flea scope and here we go Ah, oh well. So there you go. You can see that the Simon game works. It looks like we're going to have ourselves another giveaway. The nice folks at Hacker Boxes have graciously offered to send a Hacker Box 102 to the lucky comment picked at random. We'll be picking the comment on June 3rd. And remember, Hacker Boxes only ships to U.S. addresses for this giveaway. So if your comment's picked, but you don't have a U.S. shipping address that we can use, we'll need to pick someone else. Good luck. Now, sadly, by the time I'm recording this, there are no more HackerBox 102s to be had. But don't let that stop you from checking out HackerBoxes. They've got great stuff, and it's always a fun surprise to get every month. Had it not been for HackerBoxes, I may not have even found out about the Fleescope. So that's one of the things I like about them. Now, if you do want to get a Fleescope, there is still a way to get one. And this is the preferred way that Rich, the creator of the project, would like for you to get them. This helps him out the most, and that is from Elecro. And I will include a link to this in the description. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.